Pag ko po muna. Okay, and then please, please go. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Ayan po, ano. Pagsubok na naman ba? Huwag <laughs> naman. Ayan po. All right, so I think we're live on Facebook now. So good evening, everyone from the Philippines. So good afternoon from you, Mr. M, and good afternoon as well to Mr. Jack. So okay, uh, we were graced again to have a lecture from uh, Sir, Sir Irving Neil Temporal from Niner, from Niner 9.0, our review center. So take it away, Sir Irving. Glad to see okay. you. Okay. I'll just share my screen. Okay, there you go. So good evening, everyone. This is the last subtest that we're going to discuss. In the last few weeks, we talked about speaking, followed by writing task two, writing task one, and then two weeks ago, we had reading. So for tonight, we're going to talk about listening. Now, this is not to say that this is the last free lecture from 9.09er, but what I'm saying is it's the last of the four subtests. Now, let's talk about listening as a subtest. This is exactly the same for both academic and general training candidates. Now, if you wonder what are the differences between the two, there are slight differences in reading and writing task two, while there is a very crucial difference in writing task one. Whereas speaking and listening are exactly the same for all examinees. So whether you're taking academic or general training, the discussion for tonight is applicable for you. Now, IELTS is further subdivided into two. Speaking is the only subtest that's not conducted together with the written exams, but for the written exams, it's always listening, which comes first, followed by reading, and then writing. Now, to give you an idea, listening comes first 99% of the time, except if there are technical difficulties in the listening subtest. So what if all of a sudden the recording cannot be played or there is some issue with the sound system? That's when the test sup uh, supervisor may decide to start with reading or writing. But this is only when there is something wrong or there is a technical issue with the listening recording. Now, let's focus on listening. So. As you see here on your screen, this is divided into four sections of varying difficulty. So when we say varying, we expect that the first section is usually, but not always, the easiest. And as sections progress, the difficulty also increases, which means to say section four is typically the most challenging of them all. Now, how many points are there per section? 10 points. So if you do the mathematics, the grand total, 40 points in the listening subtest. You also see here the time allotment. So the test supervisor will give you 30 minutes to number one, listen to the recording. Number two, answer the questions. Now, this is when the slight difference between pen and paper and computer-delivered IELTS enters the picture. Why? For pen and paper IELTS, the test supervisor is always required to give all the candidates 10 extra minutes to review their work and transfer the answers to the answer sheet. But what about computer-delivered IELTS? It's entirely up to the test supervisor. 
There are certain test supervisors who don't give extra time anymore to transfer the answers for the simple reason that the candidates are not answering on a scratch paper or a test booklet. The candidates answer immediately using the keyboard. Now, there are certain test supervisors who allow the candidates to have a scratch paper. So this is when these test supervisors give the candidates just two minutes to review their work. But it will never happen that the computer-delivered IELTS test supervisor will give the candidates 10 extra minutes after the listening recording. So you see, that's a slight difference between pen and paper listening and computer-delivered listening. Now, let's talk about the passing score. If you have attended the previous sessions, you should have known by now that IELTS is not a pass or fail examination. So how then do we know if we made it or not? The required band score typically depends on number one, your country of choice. Where are you going? Number two, it's also affected by the type of visa that you're applying for. So what are the five visas that require an English examination? Fiance visa, spouse visa, immigrant visa, working visa, student visa. And number three, your occupation or your profession. So these three will tell you what should be your target band score. Now, I know for a fact, because teaching IELTS for 15 years now, I opened Niner in April of 2007, but I started teaching IELTS in May of 2006. More than half of people enrolling in IELTS preparation courses are not yet sure where they want to go. One thing's for sure, though, they're planning to go to U.S., U.K., Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. But they are not yet sure which of these destinations they are going to pick. In fact, they are not sure which English examination to take. So if I may give some unsolicited advice, the, uh, the English examination that I recommend depends on your destination. So like what I've said, this is just my opinion. You might uh, want to disagree with me, but like what I've said, this is just my pick. If you are targeting U.S. or Canada, then my recommended English examination for you is IELTS. If you are 100% sure that you want to go to U.K. or Ireland, and that you are never entertaining the idea of going to U.S. or Canada, this is when I recommend you take OET. But if ever you're targeting Australia or New Zealand or the specific visa that you're applying for accepts PTE, 100% sure I will recommend PTE. Now, what about TOEFL? What about CELPIT? Because these are other English examinations. So TOEFL test of English as a foreign language is widely accepted in the United States of America. And usually this is the alternative if you're going to U.S. Most especially because there are states in America that accept only TOEFL and they don't recognize other English examinations. Well, that's not surprising because TOEFL is an American product. But what about CELPIP, spelled as C-E-L-P-I-P? -E Letter C, that's Canadian. So that is your clue that CELPIP is acceptable only if you're going to Canada. Or even if you're already in Canada, then you're applying for permanent residency. So what is C-E-L-P-I-P? -E Canadian English Language Proficiency Index Program. So those are the five English examinations that I've mentioned. There's IELTS, TOEFL, PTE, CELPIP, and OET. And like what I've said earlier, my recommendation, um, my recommendation depends on your preferred destination. But what if you're 100% sure that you're going to take IELTS? A lot of people are asking, sir, what if I want to qualify for all visas? I want to qualify for all countries. What grade should I aim for per subtest? So, Typically, when I conduct classes, I want the audience to participate. So let me check the chat box. Okay, please let me know. What grade are you supposed to target or aim 
for if you want to apply for all visas and if you want to be accepted by all six English speaking countries. Kindly type on the chat box. What should be your target band score? Okay, baby boy replied seven and above for all. Who else? What about the others? Seven, seven, seven. Okay, it seems to me that most of you think that it is seven, but Ethel actually got it correctly. Eight in all subtests. Now, some of you might be thinking, which visa requires an eight in all subtests? Clarification it's not as if it's the requirement. It's just that when you are migrating to Australia, usually the, the minimum is 6.0 per subtest. But it's not as if, if you get at least six in all subtests, you will be getting a specific uh, immigration or specific points for immigration. Now, if you're migrating to Australia and you get seven in all subtests, you are usually awarded 10 immigration points. It's just that if you get eight in all subtests, that's when you will be awarded with 20 immigration points. So you see the difference, 10 versus 20 immigration points. When you migrate to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, it's not as if, okay, I got min minimum of six, I can go there. These three countries he usually invite the candidates with higher immigration points. Now, there is nothing much we can do about your age. What about your first degree relative who is a citizen or permanent resident there? If you don't have a relative, then you cannot force it now. Now, what about educational attainment? It might take two to three years before you can get your master's degree or your PhD. And what about work experience? Usually, it would take another year for you to be added or for you to get additional points. It's just that. It might take a week. It might take a month for you to get a higher bad score in the IELTS. That is why. When you're migrating to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, more than anything else, it's English proficiency that will pull you up. So I repeat, if you get eight in all subtests, you're going to get the highest immigration points for Australia. Thereby, this means to say that you are qualified to apply for all visas in all six English-speaking countries. Now, if you're going to tell me, sir, I am not choosy. I just want to have a destination. Now, we already know that Australian immigrant visa is usually the one that requires the highest band score. So will you please guess which country and which visa usually requires the lowest band score? So on the chat box, I need you to indicate number one, the country, and number two, which visa usually accepts the lowest band score. Okay, kindly type. ER comp said Canada, but which visa? Okay, ER comp provincial nominee program. Yes, you are correct. Okay, just to let you know, there are a lot of ways on how you can enter Canada. You can enter Canada as a student, or if it's immigrant visa that you're applying for, you can go for Express Entry, Federal Skilled Worker Program, Quebec Immigration Program, Atlantic Immigration Pilot, Provincial Nominee Program. It's just that Provincial Nominee Program, or PNP is usually the one that accepts the lowest band scores. So what band scores am I talking about? I need you to be all ears in this one and be inspired because even with the following grades, you might be qualified to migrate to Canada. So for listening, it's 4.5. You heard me right, 4.5. Now, what's the equivalent of that? in the listening subtest in IELTS. Roughly 15 correct answers out of 40 points. So that means to say, with more mistakes than correct answers, you can still migrate to Canada via the provincial nominee program. Ooh, interesting. What about reading? It's 3.5. And the others are saying, huh? What is 3.5 in IELTS reading? If we talk about the raw score, usually that's nine correct 
answers out of 40 points. Which means to say, even if you don't read anymore, all you have to do is to make nine correct guesses, you can still migrate to Canada via the Provincial Nominee Program. What about writing? If it's PNP, usually four is enough. What is four in writing? Well, when your writing task is not finished, when your answer is not responsive to the question, and when you commit a mistake in almost every sentence, that is 4.0. Hmm, interesting. What about speaking? Well, when your answers are relatively short and most of them are off topic and you commit quite a lot of mistakes, well, that's a four in speaking. Let me say that not everyone is qualified to apply for provincial nominee program. So how does this work? Now, you need to have a sponsor in Canada. So sponsor could mean employer. It could mean a relative who is already a citizen or permanent resident. Now, that sponsor, whether employer or relative, will nominate you to the provincial government for you to be invited. That's why it's provincial nominee program. So to speak, it's not the federal government giving you a visa, but it's the provincial government of that specific province where you have an employer, a sponsor, or a relative. So let me clarify. Not everyone is qualified to apply for a provincial nominee program. Perhaps after this free class, you might want to check if you have a prospect employer or you have a, a sponsor or a relative in the Canadian provinces that are open so that your target in IELTS is just a 4.5 in listening, 3.5 in reading, 4 in writing, 4 in speaking. Now, someone asks me, sir, what if I get lower than that? And my response is, huh? Lower than that? Well, here are your options. Okay, number one, you get a knife and you commit suicide. Char, I'm just kidding. I'm just letting you know that Canadian Provincial Nominee Program is the one that requires the lowest band scores across all visa applications. So now let's take a look at the typical passing score. As you can see here on your screen, if you are a skilled worker, the requirement usually depends on your employer, but most employers require a minimum of five. The other is 5.5, the other is six. So if you're a butcher, welder, electrician, lineman, mechanic, cook, it's best to ask your employer what grade they require you to get in the exam. Now, what about immigrants? So as you can see here, it says case-to-case -case basis. I have given you an idea earlier that if you're migrating to Canada, Australia, or New Zealand, your immigration agent is going to assess you based on your age, work experience, educational background, availability of partner or spouse, availability of a relative there, and your English proficiency. So usually it's English proficiency score that is going to pull you up. That's why it says here, case-to-case -case basis, it is not fixed. What about student visa applicants? It's like when you apply for a specific school. There are certain schools that require higher scores as compared to the others. That is why. What is the first step if you're applying for a student visa? We need you to choose a school because that school will tell you the required band score. So normally, if you're applying for diploma course, it's 5 or 5.5 or sometimes 5.5 .5 to 6. If you're applying for a bachelor's degree, most schools require 6 or 6.5. If it's master's degree, 6.5 to 7. If it's PhD, 7 to 7.5. But don't be surprised if you're applying for an Ivy League university. Say, for instance, Harvard, Cambridge, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, or MIT. 
don't be surprised if these schools require you to get an A. So like what I've said, if it's student visa, you ask the school because the school will tell you what must be your target in the IELTS. Now, what about the next category? It says nurses for the United States of America. As you can see, it does not say required score, but it says safe score. That's because U.S. just looks at your grade in speaking and overall band score. So for speaking, your target must be 7. For the overall band, it's 6.5. So how do you get 6.5 overall band score? We discussed this repeatedly in the last few sessions, but if you're attending for the very first time now, all you have to do is to aim for a 6 in listening, 6 in reading, 6 in writing. That will give you an overall band score of 6.5. If you get 5.5 in listening, totally fine for as long as reading or writing is going to pull you up. But if we look at the probability, it's not usually listening that's going to pull you down, but instead it's listening that will pull you up. What about the next category? It says here, nurses for UK, Australia, New Zealand. If you want to be registered with UK NMC, Nursing and Midwifery Council, or Australia's NMBA, that's Nursing and Midwifery Board of Australia, or NZNC, New Zealand Nursing Council, then you have to get seven. That's 30 or better out of 40 points. What else do we have here? Do we have more categories? One moment. Okay. Okay. Now, it says here, nurses for Canada. This is the tricky part because usually this is not the requirement if you're applying for a student visa or you're applying for immigrant visa. There are nurses who are already in Canada because they entered as an immigrant or a student, but they want to practice their profession. This is when nurses who would like to work in the hospital need to get a 7.5. That's 33 or better. So now let us take a look at the correspond. Okay. Sorry, I have to mention uh, the requirement for nurses going to Ireland. It's 6.5. So 27 or better. For the benefit of the nurses who are not yet entirely aware of the requirements in Ireland, Ireland wants you to get three sevens and one 6.5. So it doesn't matter in which subjects you're able to get that 6.5. So if you get a 6.5 in listening, make sure that your reading, writing, and speaking are 7. But if we look at the reality, it's usually writing, which is the most challenging subject. So if I may recommend your target going to Ireland must be a 7 in listening, reading, and speaking, then you aim for 6.5 in writing. Because like what I've said, that's the most challenging of them all. Now, let's take a look at the transmutation table. Okay, obviously 9.0 is the highest. In this case, it says 5.0, 20 and below. It does not mean that if you get 1.0, uh, if you get uh, 1 over 40, you are going to get 5. It's just that normally I don't discuss the band score equivalence from 1 to 4.5 because even if you're just applying for fiancé visa or spouse visa or you're a skilled worker or you're applying for Canadian Provincial Nominee Program, I don't really recommend you to aim for 1 to 4.5. For personal gratification, for self-bragging rights, I want everyone to aim for 5 to 9. Now, someone asked me, sir, how come the band score equivalents are not fixed? Like, look at 7. It's 30 to 32. Sir, why can't you ju just give us a definite band score equivalent? Well, that's because... I have mentioned this previously, but if you were not able to attend those free lectures I've conducted in the last few weeks, I want you to know that IELTS band score, band scores are not, a uh, band score equivalents are not fixed. Typically, this is the guide. It's the difficulty of the material 
that will give you an idea what are the band square equivalents. So in IELTS, if the material is easy, that means to say the band score equivalents are higher. But if the material is more difficult, then the band score equivalents are lower. So if you look at seven, if the material is easy, then seven might be 32. But if the material is difficult, that's when they adjust seven to 30. So what you see here is a rough estimate. I, I guess most of you are nurses going to America. So what should be your target? 24 to 26. Now, let us go back to the presentation. And this time, let's move to, yeah, that's what I said earlier. Bad score equivalents are not fixed. Okay. So for listening, before we go to this part right here, I want you to know that if you're taking computer delivered examination, wherever you are in the world, world, you are always given an individual headset. So if this is the case, you cannot blame anyone like the sound system that you were not able to hear it simply because everyone is provided with an individual headset. But I'd like to check how many of you here are taking the IELTS in the Philippines, okay? For those of you who are taking the IELTS Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. So here's a question from uh, Gaia. How about medical technology, uh, medical technologist or biomedical scientist? Well, I'm 100% sure that U.S. is open for med techs. So still, because it's U.S. visa screen, a 7 in speaking and 6.5 overall band score. There are not too many biomedical scientists that I've encountered, so that I do not know because I don't pretend to know everything. If I do not know, I'll say it up front so that we won't be selling or we won't be telling you lies here, okay? But for med techs going to America, it's a 7 in speaking and 6.5 overall. So going back to what I was saying, how many of you are taking the examination in the Philippines but outside of Metro Manila? Will you please comment me on the chat box? Again, how many are taking the examination in the Philippines but outside of Metro Manila? So there's just Marion, there's Jazz, Tur, Rem. Okay, why am I asking? Because if you were taking the examination in Metro Manila, if it is paper-based IELTS, you will be provided by IDP with individual headsets in the listening subtest, even if it's paper-based IELTS. Now, if you're taking the examination outside of Metro Manila, there are two possibilities. Either individual headsets or sound system type. So next to Metro Manila, it's Metro Cebu that uses individual headsets. Now for other locations, eventually, little by little, the testing centers will bring the headsets to the different parts of the Philippines. And there will come a time that everyone taking the IELTS in the Philippines will have an individual headset. Like what I've said, that's in the pipeline, but that is not yet the case for now. So I repeat, if you are going to take computer-delivered IELTS, wherever you are in the world, you'll be provided with individual headsets. But if you're taking paper-based IELTS, it depends on your test location. If it's Metro Manila, IDP will provide you with individual headsets, but outside of Metro Manila, some locations might use headsets, the others still the typical sound system type. But there will come a time, who knows, it might be 2021 or by next year, when all of the paper-based candidates in listening will also be provided with individual headsets. Now, for computer-delivered IELTS, usually there are only eight candidates inside the computer lab, especially here in the Philippines. We still have social distancing measures in place. I am not sure what about the case in other countries, but as IDP and British Council told me, it's conducive if there are only 15 people taking computer-delivered exam at the same time. Time. But what if you're taking paper based IELTS? Where are the venues? Usually they rent big function rooms, ballrooms. So when I took the examination more than a decade ago, imagine there were 300 to 400 examinees in one 
very a huge function room. So where did I first uh, where did I first take my IELTS? Edsa Shangri-La in Ortigas. Now, I am letting you know because for paper-based IELTS, you can't just sit anywhere. Before you enter the room, you have to look at the seat plan. So first, you register. And then you look at the seat plan and you have to identify your candidate number. And that's where you will find your seat. So usually, you are arranged alphabetically. But it's not as if all A's are seated in front while all Z's are seated at the back. It's alphabetical yet vertical. So there is a possibility that if your surname is Aquino, letter A might be the first letter. But because the second letter is Q, alphabetically, there are more surnames that will come before Aquino. So if you are Aquino, do not be surprised if you are possibly seated at the back. Now, what if your surname is Zacharias? Yes, the first letter might be Z, but alphabetically, there are family names that come after Zacharias. Still, there is a tendency for Zacharias to be seated in front. Now, before the start of the actual listening test, this is when they are going to make a sound check. So the test supervisor will play the listening recording for 5 to 10 seconds, and that's when the test supervisor will ask you, is this loud enough? Is this clear? This is the only time that they entertain concerns regarding the seat plan. So this is when you call the attention of the test supervisor and say, excuse me, test supervisor, I can't hear it as much from where I am. Will you please transfer me to a chair beside the speaker? No problem with that kind of request. You paid 11,650 pesos for this examination. That is an amount easily wasted in three hours. That is why that is your right as an IELTS candidate to demand where you can possibly sit down. But they will only give you that chance or opportunity during the listening sound check. When listening officially starts, you can no longer change seats until the end of the written exams at around 12 noon. Now, I have a question for you guys. Is there a possibility that the listening recording is going to be repeated? Yes or no? Kindly comment on the chat box. Is there a possibility for the listening recording to be repeated? Yes or no? Okay. Tur and ER said yes. Hazel, no. Baby boy said yes. The others, no, yes, no, yes, 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 yes. Okay. We want consistency. So I want to remind everyone, if everything goes according to plan, it's like this. You'll hear the recording the first and the last time. But during which instances... Are, uh, during which instances are the test supervisors allowed to repeat the section? When there are technical issues, all of a sudden, the recording stopped playing. So this is when Cambridge gives authority to the test supervisors to repeat the entire section. I did not say the entire test. I said the entire section. Now, just what if? What if a technical difficulty occurred when you took the examination? In which particular section would you prefer or rather that the technical difficulty is going to occur? Section 1, 2, 3, or 4? Can you comment on the chat box? Okay. It seems that you're able to get the logic of this. The four of you responded section 4. Why? Obviously, we have mentioned earlier that section four is the most challenging. That's the case most of the time. Now, if ever the problem is going to happen on a section four, question, which particular number or which particular item in section four would you rather that the technical difficulty is going to occur? Give me a number from 31 to 40. Okay, Tur said 40, ER comp 39 to 40. Well, Hazel Marie uh, responded 30 to 40. Well, it, it says choose one, okay? Now, imagine uh, the response of Lovely is 
31. Now, if ever the technical difficulty happened in number 31, then obviously the test supervisor is going to replay from the beginning of section 4, which means to say you're only going to get the answer that you missed for 31. But what if it's number 40? Class, imagine the test supervisor is going to repeat the entire section 4, which means to say you can possibly hear the answers the second time around for numbers 31 to 39. That is why I cannot forget this incident that happened in 2008. All of a sudden, well, during that time, they were, they were still using CD. All of a sudden, the CD jumped. And so there was a technical issue. And that's why the test supervisor had no choice but to repeat the entire section for. That's why for that day alone, we had 19 reviewees who got 9.0 in listening and 28 reviewees who got 8.5 in listening, or roughly 38 or 39 over 40. That is why, I'm just kidding, as early as now, perhaps you can look for the sound system operator of the, the test venue and then uh, inform Kuya. Kuya, if you feel that the recording is about to finish, please unplug it. Shit, like brown out. Kidding aside, I'm just giving you an idea. It is possible for the listening recording to be repeated only if there are technical concerns, technical issues, okay? Yes, Miss Gladys, befriend the, uh, the sound system operator. But like what I've said, don't take my word for it. I'm just giving you this as a possible scenario. Now, let's go back to our discussion. So... Okay, why is it that listening is considered the easiest of all subtests? Number one, you're not going to think of the answer on your own. The answers will always be mentioned by the speakers. All you have to do is to take note of the answer. At the same time, the test takers here are not required to produce an answer. Output. You're not going to write an essay. You're not going to deliver a speech. All you have to do is to take note of the answers as mentioned by the speakers. But obviously, even if this is the easiest of all the subtests, it's not a giveaway. There will always be challenges in the IELTS. So what are these challenges that we're talking about? Well, I was not able to write it here, but challenge number one is Accent familiarization. And number two, speed. Now let's talk about accent. Class, looking at the name of this examination, I-E-L-T-S, will everyone please comment on the chat box what is the meaning of letter I? I stands for, what is I? Okay. I means international, which means to say it is a fallacy to encounter only American accent or British accent or Australian accent in the listening subtest. When I first attended this, uh, this IELTS workshop some 14 years ago in 2007, the first misconception that was debunked by the speaker Letter I international means it's a combination of native and non-native accents, which means to say you might be encountering non-native speakers, say, for instance, uh, Eastern Europeans or Latinos or Africans or Asians talking in English in the recording with their own local accent. Don't get me wrong. They are going to talk in English all the time. But not all speakers have the American or British or Australian accent. This is why in the listening recording, there are words which are not delivered in the same way all over the world. Now, we're not going to focus on the non-native accents. We're going to talk about the native accents first. Class, American British, Australian, 
Canadian, uh, Kiwi, or Irish accent, which accent are we Filipinos most familiar with? Which accent are we Filipinos most familiar with? Okay, E-R, U-S. Yes, Hazel, American, American, American. Well, you are correct. Why? This is not surprising knowing that the Philippines is a former American colony. Almost everything in the Philippines is American. And usually, Filipinos with good English or above average English, usually they have the American accent. It's just that it's a little bit unfortunate for us Filipinos because the accent that we are most familiar with is not as common in the IELTS as compared to British and Australian accent. Why? This is something that I have learned when I went to UK. A lot of the locals feel bad that the Americans have bastardized the English language. Why? There are certain terms acceptable in America, but are not acceptable in formal English. Say, for instance, ain't, gonna, whatcha, no, I'm saying, whatchamacallit. These are terms typically used in America, but are not welcome in formal English. Now, this means to say that, yes, usually British Australian accent are more popular or more common in the IELTS. Now, if there's an interesting tidbit I'd like to share with you, the complete name of UK is what? It's United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which means to say there are four countries within the UK. Will you please tell me what are the four countries within the UK? Let me see your familiarity, okay? Thank you, ER. England is one of them. Okay. For Ireland, we have to be a little more careful. Later, I'm going to talk about that, okay? Scotland, yes, and then Wales, okay? Now, just a bit of history, because some of you might be going to the UK, okay? Now, some people are confused, sir, what is London? And how is this different from England or from Great Britain or from the UK? Because sometimes when I watch the Olympics, how come someone is representing England, another one is representing uh, Scotland, another one Wales, or another one Great Britain, another one UK? It's like this. So if we're talking about England, Scotland, and Wales, the three of them are collectively known as Great Britain. Now, here's the interesting tidbit about Ireland. Ireland used to be an entirely different country, the entire Ireland. Now, the lower four fifths, so meaning to say the southern four over five part of Ireland separated and established itself as the Republic of Ireland. Now, the northern one fifth known as Northern Ireland, joined forces with Great Britain. That is why the Northern one-fifth of Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. That's why whenever people say, I am from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that's the history behind it. So Northern Ireland might have the word Ireland in it, but it's a part of UK and not a part of the Republic of Ireland. Now, if there is something interesting I'd like to share with you, when I went to the UK, I thought that some of them were offended when I asked, hey, are you British? And then they responded by saying, I prefer to be called English. I prefer to be called Welsh or Scottish or Irish. So that's when I did my research and found out that these people over there are typically regionalistic. It's like us Filipinos, right? Now, we people from the South are more comfortable with our own language and we always call ourselves proud Bisaya. I know that there is this saying for people coming from the northern part of Luzon and they usually have this saying known as solid north. And usually that's region one and region two. 
So it's also the case in the UK. Instead of asking, hey, are you British? It might be less offensive if you're, go if you're going to ask them, are you English? Are you Welsh? Are you Scottish? Are you Irish? Now, Usually, when we say British accent, this is what we Filipinos are familiar with. The Queen's English. Stiff upper lip with teeth clenched. Now, which movie, you, uh, which movie features the Queen's English of Britain? Or if it's not a movie, you can give me a sample of a series on Netflix. Okay, audience participation this time. Will you please comment? Give me a perfect example of a movie, okay, or a Netflix series. Okay, thank you, Hazel. It's Bridgerton, okay. The Crown, correct. Who else? Or what else? Okay, so most of you are familiar with The Crown and Bridgerton. Correct. Yeah, Sherlock. Now, this might be the British English that we know. But please don't forget about the other parts of the UK. Okay? Now, let's talk about Scotland. Will you please give me examples of a movie, a series, that feature uh, rather Scottish accent. Anyone? Because this is going to be your homework. I need you to expose yourselves. Okay, ER comp. Yes, brave. The animated uh, movie featuring this red haired princess. Okay, what else? Apart from brave, something that features Scottish accent. Braveheart, okay? Now, what about, uh, what about my assignment? Okay, well, uh, baby boy, Harry Potter is most likely the English of England, okay? But for Scotland, I need you to watch that or Mar uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, for the perfect comparison between British, uh, rather, English of England and the English of Scotland, I need you to watch the, uh, the movie on Netflix, Queen Elizabeth I. That features uh, Kate Blanchett. So you will see here a typical comparison between the English of England and the English of Scotland. But if you want to be more familiar with the accent of the Scottish, I recommend that you watch Mary, the Queen of Scots, both uh, El Queen El Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots, both of them are available on Netflix. Okay. Uh, I saw here, uh, it's hard to understand. Yeah, it, it actually is. But it's like that. The more you expose yourself to the accent, the more that this doesn't sound foreign to you anymore when you encounter these words in the actual examination. Hazel asks, uh, what is the title again? Which one? The one that features Scottish English, Brave, the animated movie, Braveheart. I forgot the name of that famous actor, but you can just search for it, Braveheart. And then Mary, Queen of Scots. Okay. Now, going back to what I was saying, Usually, we are familiar with the American accent, but if you expose yourself to the crown in particular, because the crown also has parts that feature the Irish accent, at least you get to know that uh, for us Filipinos, we follow the Americans, we typically say potato, but for them, it's potato. Most of the time, we say vase, but for the people in the UK, it's vase or for us Filipinos, we say schedule, but for them, it's schedule. Or for us, we typically say singer, but for them, it's singer. I am not asking you to talk in the same way that they do, but I need you to be familiar with how they mention these words so that you won't be surprised when you encounter these 
in the actual examination. That's the point why I need you to be exposed to the accent that you're not familiar with. What's the point of watching American movies? Well, that's a kind of movie or that's typically the kind that you're exposed to since birth, right? You expose yourselves to those that you want to be familiar with. Now, what about Australians, okay? We know a lot of Americans, that's for sure. We also know a lot of famous people from the UK. But what about Aussies? Will you please comment on the chat box? Uh, chat box. Who are the most famous Aussies you're familiar with? Who are the most famous Aussies you know? Steve Irwin. Who else? Hemsworth Brothers. Yes. Chris and Liam, Hugh Chapman, Wolverine, Nicole Kidman, Kylie Minogue. They are the uh, famous Aussies. So how do they usually greet each other? If we are Filipinos and we're going to say their famous greeting, we typically say, good day, mate. But that's not how the people down under say it. It's usually, they usually say, g'day, right? Take note that a lot of Aussies are fond of shortcuts. They do not say good day, but they say g'day. Now, I'll give you more examples. McDonald's. We have our own term for that, and that's McDo. That's how we Filipinos say it, right? But can anyone guess, how do the people of Australia call McDo? Any idea? It's not just the Filipinos who are fond of shortcuts. Or the people from Cebu are also fond of shortcuts. Like if they, uh, if most Bisaya people say kalayo, in Cebu it's just kayo. Or if most people from the South usually say balay, for Cebuanos they just say bye. So that's shortcutting, right? Now, what about Australia? We call McDonald's McDo, but can someone guess how do people of Australia call McDo? Maybe it's time for me to give you the answer. It's Maccas. Maccas. It's the shortcut, okay? So for instance, in the listening recording, you might hear the speaker saying, will you please turn on the Tilly? Tilly, that's television. Or if someone in the recording said, will you please open the windy? Windy, that's window. Okay. Or what about brawly? Can someone tell me what's brawly? Any idea what's brawly? If the speaker says that, most likely the speaker is pertaining to. Any guesses? How, how many people do we have here? Oh, 47 on Zoom and uh, for sure more than 100 on Facebook. Okay. Okay. Nice try. Broccoli, but it's not broccoli. Okay. It's umbrella. Or people from Australia also have their own slang terms. So it's not just Americans with ain't, gonna, whatcha, no, I'm saying. Class, what about Avo? Uh, what is Avo? This is an Australian slang, and I've encountered it in the listening subtest. What is Avo? A R V O, Avo. Any idea? No one. It's not although. Not after. Not avocado. Avo, as in A R V O, means afternoon. So, I'm going to type this here. Here, okay. It's 5.30 p.m. Most of the time, we Filipinos say, oh, what's the time now? Oh, it's 5.30 p.m. But that's not how people in Australia say it. And mind you, IELTS is trying to mimic reality. That is why you might be encountering terms that are quite unfamiliar to you or expressions that you're going to hear for the very first time. So how do the Aussies say this? It's half past five in the other. That's 5.30 p.m. 
And in the listening subtest, something like that might be the required answer. So I'm going to type it for the benefit of everyone. Half past five in the avo. This is how Aussies say 5.30 p.m. Class, why are we sharing nuances like this? Because what's most important, you don't aim just for seven. You don't aim just for an eight. Not everyone has, uh, not everyone can say, oh, you know what? I got 9.0 in IELTS. So if you are aiming for the highest possible band score, so this is what we should be talking about in class. Something that you don't typically hear from uh, YouTube content. Okay. Now, going back to how Aussies greet each other. They usually do not say, good day, mate. It's good day, mate. So we Filipinos follow the Americans by saying today, but for Aussies, it's to die. Or us, or we Filipinos usually say yesterday, but over there, it's yes to die. Now I'm going to share this one. And this is a true to life story. I've heard this from my uh, tour guide in uh, Hungary. So while we were traveling from one city to another, he said, they're having a difficulty with Aussies as tourists. And because of this incident, once there was a, a, an Aussie tourist who flew all the way to Budapest. So that's not how the, that's not Budapest. That's how we Filipinos say it, but for the locals, it's Budapest. So there's this Aussie tourist who flew all the way to the capital of Hungary, and then he fell in love with the marvelous architectural masterpiece that is the parliament. So what he wanted to do was to take a photo of the entire parliament, of parliament using his phone. It's just that it's very huge. That's why he had a difficulty in making sure that it fits the frame of his phone. So what he did was he kept on walking back and back until such time he did not realize he's in the middle of the road. And it was almost an accident when this Hungarian cab driver was about to kill him because he was in the middle of the road trying to take a photo of the parliament. That's why the Hungarian cab driver was so mad. He went out of the car and he called the attention of the Aussie tourists and say, hey, excuse me, did you come here to die? What's the response of the Aussie tourists? I, no, I might, I came here, yes, to die. So apparently, they did not understand each other, right? What's the point of the Hungarian cab driver? In Tagalog, what he meant was, Hoy, baliw ka ba? Pumunta ka ba dito para magpakamatay? To die as in T-O-D-I-E. But what about the understanding of the Aussie tourist? Did you come here to die? His understanding was, Oy, friend, pumunta ka ba dito ngayong araw na to? To die as in T-O-D-A-Y. So this is a perfect example of miscommunication just because of differences in the way people mention certain words. So during the review proper, you will be familiar with the other uh, slang terms used by Australians, and you'll never know if these might be the words that you're going to encounter in your actual examination. Now, we've talked about America. We've talked about UK, Australia. What about New Zealand? Okay, question. Who are the most famous people uh, from New Zealand whom you know? Kindly type. Who are the most famous Kways that you know? I'm sure you can name a lot of Americans, a lot of Brits, a few Aussies, but what about Kways? It's 9.59 p.m. Move, move, ladies and gentlemen. I'm waiting. Okay. Well, let me verify that. But I actually do not know if Tom Holland is really from New Zealand. In fact, whenever people ask me, so who is the most famous person you know from New Zealand? I can only name one, and that's Aquaman. Okay. Jason Momoa. Well, it's not as if uh, he lived there all his life, but whenever he's asked, he always mentions that, oh, uh, my lineage is actually with New Zealand. The point why I asked is because 
we know a lot of Americans, Brits, and Aussies, but not too many people from New Zealand. That's why we are not very familiar with how they talk. So I just would like to share something, okay? We also send students to New Zealand. That is why I have a counterpart in New Zealand accepting the students that we send over there. Her name is Mora, and she's based in Auckland. Sometimes we're talking about certain countries in Europe, and I need you to pay attention to how she mentions these countries in Europe. Okay, here we go. Number one, Denmark. Number two, Finland. Number three, Czech Republic. Okay, one by one, I need you to tell me which countries did Mora mention. Number one, Denmark is our, kindly comment, okay, that's Denmark. What about Finland? That is our Finland, correct. What about Czech Republic? That is our Czech Republic. That is our Czech Republic. So what did you notice that in New Zealand, I is not I and E is not E. Class, usually I becomes E and E becomes I. That's why I did not say Kiwi. Class, they usually prefer the term Kiwi instead of New Zealander. So I did not say Kiwi, but I said Kiwi, right? Now, if that is the case in New Zealand, that I becomes E and E becomes I. What about bike? Baka naging Becky ang bike in New Zealand because I becomes E and E becomes I. So kidding aside, I'm just giving you an idea that people do not mention words in the same way all over the world. Say, for instance, this very famous uh, English food, which is fish and chips. That's not how the people from New Zealand say it. They usually mention it this way. Let me just type it. So fish and chips, usually that's how we say it. But for the people of New Zealand, they say something like fish and chops. Not fish, okay? Not fish and chips. It's fish and chops. So sometimes when these are the answers required in the listening subtest, you might be, did I hear it correctly? Remember, you are not the native speaker. They are the native speaker. So we follow them. We don't always rely on our ears. Okay. What about Canada? Where is Canada? Canada is located north of the United States of America. They are the top two countries in the North American continent. That's why it's not surprising when you hear uh, Canadians talk like the Americans. But there are certain words that are a giveaway. Like how do you know that someone is Canadian? The word about. Americans usually say about. But for Canadians, they say it as a boot. So for instance, if you ask a Canadian, hey, let's talk about this and that. And then a Canadian might be telling you, oh, I'm sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about. So a boot, that's how Canadians typically say this word. So hopefully with that short orientation on the differences between uh, delivery of Americans versus the other native speakers, hopefully this will help you in preparing for the examination. Because remember, that's the first concern in IELTS listening unfamiliarity with the accent. What about number two? Speed. And what can speed mean in the IELTS? Number one, most speakers talk too fast. So you better catch up with what they're saying. Or sometimes they don't talk too fast, but sometimes they give the answers one after another. So in listening, even if it's the easiest of them all, because all answers will be mentioned, it's also in listening where you are busiest. Your eyes must be busy in reading the questions on the test booklet or the monitor. 
Your ears must be paying attention to the recording and you have to fight short attention span. You have to focus because if there is no technical difficulty, then you're going to hear the first and the last time. And what about the last task that you're supposed to do? Your hands must be busy in taking note of the answers or in making sure that you're able to get the correct answer the moment the speaker mentioned it. That's why you are very busy in the listening subtest. So what is the proposed remedy here? Remedy. Okay. Well, it says, listen to your CDs, but I know that CDs are no longer, pop no longer popular now. So let me say audio files or recordings, okay? It says here that you have to expose yourself to these audio materials even without answering the practice tests yet. You heard me right, even if you don't answer the practice tests. This is just for you to be exposed to the accent. Class. If you don't want to look at something, for sure, you cannot see it if you're going to close your eyes. We can possibly do that because we have eyelids, right? But if you don't want to hear something, you have no choice but to hear it because we don't have ear lids. Class, exposure bridges the gap. So once you're exposed, you eventually become familiar. That's when you expect comprehension to follow. Okay, now we're going to focus on the test-taking strategies for the listening subtest. Let me just get my water. This is not a break, just a moment. Okay, let's take a look at the three stages for each section. Let's begin with before listening. So it's not as if when the test supervisor says, okay, let's start. Then the recording is going to play immediately. No, there is what we call grace period before the actual recording. And we call this before listening. Now it says here, we need you to read the questions in advance. But why? Because that will give you an idea which specific information to pay attention to in the recording later on. So 30 minutes divided by four sections, that's roughly seven to eight minutes per section. But out of seven to eight minutes, you'll only be needing 10 answers for each section. So for sure, there are more details that you do not need as compared to the details that you need. If you read the questions beforehand, then you don't have to pay attention to every single word. You'll just have to wait for the answer to be mentioned by the speaker. This is one way of studying smarter, not studying harder. Studying harder is when you exert effort, when you do everything in your own capacity, but sometimes it only makes you tired or exhausted. Studying smarter does not mean you have to invest a thousand of hours just to pass or ace the examination, but knowing what to do to maximize your chances in getting the highest possible band score. So don't study harder, but study smarter. Class, before listening, we also encourage everyone to Try answering the questions before listening to the recording. And you're going to say, huh, sir, you want us to try answering? But for sure, we're wrong because we haven't heard the speakers yet. This is exactly the point. This is what we call warm up. We want your brain to start working or to start functioning even before the start of the subtest. Like most, uh, most athletes, when they start playing, obviously, they need to do some push-ups or some stretching first. And this is the point why I need you to try answering the questions before listening to the recording. Now, we have three examples here on the right-hand side of the screen. Three gap fill or fill in the blank questions. And I need you to try to guess what's the correct word that we might be looking for. So number one, report to the blank. Usually, who do we report to? 
Try to predict the answer before listening to the recording. Kindly comment your answer is on the chat box. Report to the, okay, thank you, Hazel. Police. Other possible answers aside from the police. Okay, could be authorities or to the government. Okay, I actually don't mind if your answers are wrong. We just want you to stretch your uh, brain, okay? It's warming up your brain cells, your neurons, okay? What about the second blank? If lost, blank them. Usually when something's lost, what do we do? Return them. Thank you, Hazel. What about the others? Hide. <laughs> Why are you going to hide? <laughs> so if something is lost, find them, okay? Return them. Now, what about the last blank? Blank of the item. Keep them. <laughs> okay. Blank of the item. We're on the third blank now. Number of the item. Cost of the item. Uh, description of the item. So, this will allow you to try to, hmm, what could be the words that I'm going to hear later on? So your answers here don't have to be correct. Guessing will start things running, okay? Now that's what you're supposed to do before listening. Let's now move on to the second stage, and that is... I already said that. Anticipate what you're going to hear. So during listening, because if there is no technical difficulty, you're going to hear the recording for the very first and last time. That's why it says focus. You listen intently because you're not given a second time to listen to that. You fight short attention span because if you miss an answer for that particular item, sometimes it's very difficult to catch up. Like you need to wait for the next section before you can go back to the recording. And that is the worst possible nightmare happening to a candidate in the actual examination. You've prepared hard for this examination, investing in hours for your preparation. And then all of a sudden in the actual examination, you missed an answer because you were thinking of something else. You were too mentally preoccupied. You can be mentally preoccupied, say for instance, just for a bit in reading or even for mental block, like one to two minutes in writing. But in listening, that is the mortal sin that you must never commit. Now, let's move on to number three. There's what we call after listening. So after the section is finished, the test supervisor or the speaker in the recording will give you extra time to review your work for that particular section. So usually you're given a few seconds for that work. So you have before listening, you have after listening. Can we make sure to maximize these two grace periods? Now, let us move on to the format on how is it the format already? Wait a minute. Okay, so here are rules applicable in both listening and reading. I did not discuss this when I uh, talked about the reading subjects, but I need you to be all ears on this one because these are also applicable in reading. Now, let us begin with letter A, crop versus crops. Will someone tell me what is the issue here for letter A? Crop versus crops. Most likely it is something to do with... It's 10.13 and I need to know that you are still with me. Crop versus crops. What's the issue here? Thank you, Hazel. Most likely singular and plural. So in IELTS, singular must be singular. Plural must be plural. But you're going to ask, so sir, how do I know if the required answer is singular or plural? Let's take a look at this one. Okay. Can we look at this example? Well, it says, performances are done by Australian Black. Will you please tell me, is the correct answer artist or artists? On the chat box, please. Jazz said 
artists? Hazel said artists. What about the others? Is it artists or artists? Mm -hmm. There are almost 50 of you on Zoom. But so far, only Jazz and Derek and Sakshi got it right. It's plural artists. Why? Remember the rule? Okay, I need you to look at this one. The articles uh, and an denote singularity. So if you see these articles, or obviously you don't put them together. So either of these two articles before the noun, most likely it means singular. But if you don't see this article, a uh, or an, that means say the required answer is plural. So going back to that example, performances are done by Australian blank. That's artists. When do we say the correct answer is artist? That's when it's performances are done by an Australian artist. So be careful in the IELTS. Singular must be singular, while plural must be plural. Okay, let's move on to letter B. Cook versus cooked. What do you think is the issue here? Cook versus cooked. What's the issue here? Anyone? Okay, thank you, bro Pete. It's cook, uh, it's the tense of the verb. So past should be past, whereas present must be in the present tense. Now, cook is wrong if cooked is the required answer. But how will you know if it's present tense or past tense that you're going to follow? Let's take a look at this example, okay? The question is, what did Anna do to improve her English? Now, what is the tense of the question? What did Anna do to improve her English? Okay, thank you, Bless. Thank you, Bropy, Baby Boy, Derek, for saying it's past because of the word did. But what if the speaker in the recording said I am listening to the radio. Class, listening, obviously that's in the present tense. So you see, there is a conflict here. The question is in the past tense, whereas the speaker said the answer in the present tense. Now, before I show you what's the correct answer, will you please tell me which tense are we going to follow in writing the answer? Is it present tense or past tense? Should we write the correct answer in present tense or past tense? Okay, it seems that you're able to get this correctly. It has to be in the past tense because the question is in the past tense. So the correct answer, listened to the radio following the tense of the question, what did? Now, if you're going to write listening to the radio, Yes, that's exactly what the speaker said. It's just that this tense is not consistent with the tense of the question. Okay, so letter B, cook versus cooked. Be careful when it comes to consistency of verb tense, uh, consistency of verb tenses. Now let's move on to letter C, more challenging versus much challenging. Class, what's the issue for letter C? More challenging versus much challenging. What's the issue? Mm -hmm. Okay, for the benefit of everyone, in IELTS, listening and reading, do not paraphrase. No editing, no rewording whatsoever. Well, in speaking and writing, we encourage you to paraphrase. But in listening, what you hear is what you write. And in reading, what you see in the passage is what you write on the answer sheet. So I understand that more and much are somehow related. But if the speaker said more challenging, do not write much challenging. 
So this bullet point explains everything. More challenging is strong if much challenging is the required answer and vice versa. No editing, no rewording, no paraphrasing whatsoever in listening and reading. One moment. Mm -hmm. What seems to be... Okay. Now let's move on to letter D. Center or center? What's the issue here? Center or center? This one's very easy, guys. What's the issue for letter D? For sure, it is something to do with spelling. So I need to remind everyone in IELTS, both American and British spelling are accepted. But there is one rule you have to remember. If you start with American spelling, make sure you're consistently using the American spelling from beginning to end. If you start with the British spelling, it has to be British from top to bottom. But my question for you guys, as Filipinos, which kind of spelling are we more familiar with? Is it American spelling or British spelling? Okay. Without a doubt, it's American because that's when we're exposed to since birth. Now, you're going to tell me, sir, I want to practice British spelling because by the time I arrive in the UK, I want to have a correct spelling. Well, not necessarily the case because the truth of the matter is this is going to be the last time in your life that your, your spelling will be checked. In fact, don't take this against me, but not all native speakers know how to spell. Why? Because if this is their first language, they don't care about it anymore, right? Like, I'll challenge you. By the time you arrive in the U.S., by the time you arrive in the U.K., you ask the locals how to spell portage or occasion or accommodate or receive. Don't be surprised that not all the native speakers can get these correctly. Say, for instance, when we Filipinos uh, talk to each other, like when we say, anyare, we know that we're pertaining to what happened, but we don't spell it out anymore as, anong nangyari? Usually, we just say, anyare. Or, what did you say? Ansabe? We understand each other because that's our first language. But it's also the same case for native English speakers. Yes, they can communicate their thoughts well orally. But when you ask them to write it down, don't be surprised that not everyone can get it correctly. So to a certain extent, it is just unfair that we the non-native speakers have to speak spell this correctly, but for some of these native speakers, they cannot even spell correctly. Well, life's just like that. It is not fair and never meant to be fair. While we are from third world countries, wanting a better life in first world countries, so who needs to adjust? Not the native speakers, but we, the examinees of English proficiency, uh, the examinees of English proficiency tests. So let's go back to center or center. Make sure that your answers are spelled correctly and both American and British spelling are accepted. So in the case of American, spelling E comes first. In the case of British, R comes first. Now, what about this? Color, traveling, program, <coughs> judgment, disc, defense. Here are just certain examples of the differences between American and British spelling. Okay, you see that there are two bullet points here. One states that uh, answers may be written in all caps or lowercase. That's applicable in listening, reading, writing. And then erasures are also allowed on the answer sheet. But obviously for computer delivered exam, no answer sheet. Let's move on to the format in listening. Let's begin with date. If the speaker says the 5th of May, remember there are instructions when it says write no more than two words for your answer. That means to say one word correct, 
two words correct. But if the speaker said the 5th of May, you cannot write on the answer sheet the 5th of May because that means to say four words. How are you supposed to correctly write the answer? 5th May, May 5th. 5 May, May 5, it doesn't really matter. Now, what if there is a year? Class, usually what's the format? If the day comes before, rather, if the month comes before the day, you usually separate the day and the year with a comma. So May 5, comma, 1987. But if the day comes before the month, like how British and Aussies write the day, no more comma. So 5 May, 1987, or 5th May, 1987. So if the speaker says, I was born on the fifth day in the month of May in the year of our Lord, 1987. You don't have to write everything. I was born on the fifth day in the month of May in the year of our Lord, 1987. You just have to write 5 May, 1987. You're still considered correct. Apart from dates, numbers are also usually required answers in the listening subtest. So when you look at answer keys, sometimes there are dashes. Sometimes there are spaces. Take it from me. These dashes, these spaces do not matter. There is only one thing that matters when you write numbers, and that's the correct sequence of the number. But I need you to be careful because in IELTS, the speakers don't usually say 2003673399. They are fond of saying double or triple. In this case, the speaker might say this as, my student number is 2003673999. So when the speaker says double, you have to be quick, 0099, okay? Let's move on to telephone number. Okay, for a telephone number, if you look at the answer key, You'll notice that the area code or country code is usually in code uh, is usually enclosed in parentheses. However, that doesn't really matter. What matters most is, like what I've said, the correct sequence of the number. Okay. What about time? There are several formats on how you can possibly write time, but you're never wrong when you follow the format in the test booklet. So sometimes, uh. There is no o'clock, like zero, zero. All you have to do is to follow the format in the test booklet. You can't, get, uh, you can't go wrong if you look at the other items in the, uh, in the test booklet and use them as basis for your answers. Now, there are also instances when two answers are required for just one number. So how are you supposed to write the answer if this is the case? Class, if the question is, what are the two names of your speaker for tonight? Please do not write your answer as Irvin and Nil. Do not write Irvin slash Nil. Do not write Irvin or Nil. The correct answer is when you separate the two words using a comma. So Irvin, comma, Nil. That's what you have to bear in mind when you write Two answers that are required for just one number. Moving on. What about sum of money? If in the test booklet you see how much, and there's the pounds sign already, you don't have to write the pound sign anymore as part of the answer because it's in the test booklet. When are you going to write pound sign, dollar sign, or euro sign? That's when you cannot see the currency on the test booklet. The same principle is applicable here, unit of measurement. So if the question is how many meters, all you have to do is to write 50 on the answer sheet. You don't write 50 meters because the word meters is part of the question. When are you going to write the word meters? That's when the question is how long, okay? Now, let's take a look at some tips in listening. Who among you here want to get higher than the required band score? Type me. 
how many wants to get a nine in listening? How many wants to get a higher band, a higher band score? Why am I emphasizing on this one? Imagine if you only need seven and you're just aiming for seven. What if you fall short of your expectation? 6.5, this means you might not be qualified in your visa application. Uh, this means you might not be qualified in the kind of visa that you're applying for. But what if you need seven, but you're aiming for eight? At least if you fall short of your expectation, still, regardless of the circumstances, you consider yourself a passer after the exam. So we're not here to talk about seven. We're here to get the highest possible band score. It's not as if it's every day that someone can announce to the whole wide world, hey, I'm a niner in IELTS, right? So for these tips, let's take a look. What does this mean? The first bullet point, eight before seven, 19 before 18. In IELTS listening, the answers are given chronologically 99% of the time. But there are certain instances when the answer to number eight comes before the answer to number seven, or the answer for number 19 is given before the answer to number 18. Now let's take a look at this example right here. If successful, hopes a high for another six major movies to be made in South Australia over the next two years. So successful, that's the answer for number eight. Six is the answer for number seven. So if you just look at the items or if you just look at the numbers chronologically, there are certain answers that you might miss. So what is the suggestion of 9.09? Why don't you look at two consecutive items at the same time? So for instance, you have to look at one and two at the same time because you'll never know if two will be answered first before one. When the answer for number, is, for number one is given, what do you do? Look at two and three at the same time. Repeat a cycle until you reach number 40. Don't worry, because when they interchange answers, usually they're just for two consecutive items. It will never happen that in section one. First, they're going to answer number three, followed by number nine, the number one, the number 10, the number one, number five. Unfortunately, no one is going to pass the examination if that's how they're going to do it. So remember, in the event that they change the order of the answers and are not given chronologically, usually it's just for two consecutive items. That's why Niner suggests look at two consecutive numbers at the same time. Okay, for Sakshi, it says, uh, the question is, how about reading? Is it chronological? Well, two, uh, two Wednesdays ago, I conducted the reading, sub, the reading lecture. Yes, the answers are also given in chronological order, especially for true, false, not given question. But just in case you cannot find the answer for one, I, for instance, you answered number one, you answered number three, but you failed to answer number two. So it can only mean two things. You go back to the portion in the passage in between one and three, because for sure the answer to number two is in between one and three. Or if you still cannot find number two, most likely it's not given, okay? Now, let's continue. What about our next bullet point here? Note-taking is very important. So what are the details that you're supposed to take note of? The four most common answers in the listening subtest are numbers, names, places and time. So whenever you hear these details, make sure to write them down. Okay. Let's take a look at the next bullet point. When a speaker spells out an answer, you really have or spells out a word, you really need to take note of that because it's an answer for sure. The speaker is not going to waste effort or time spelling it out if in the first place it is not required. So for instance, the speaker says, my full name is George Lavillier. And then the other speaker said, Lavillier, uh, how do you spell that? It's L-A-V-I-L-L-I-E-R-S. For sure, because the speaker spelled it out, it's a required answer. So make sure not to miss these words that are spelled out. The same goes for numbers. Sakshi uh, said thank you, and I say you're welcome. Okay. 
Now, sunshine versus sunshade. What did I say earlier? That IELTS tries to mimic reality. We are humans. We are never perfect. We are bound to commit mistakes. To commit a mistake is part of our human nature. So IELTS is trying to reenact this in the examination. So what does this mean? That some speakers correct themselves, some speakers commit mistakes. So what if the speaker says, uh, the first speaker says, oh, excuse me, oh, where are you working? Then the second speaker said, uh, I'm working at Sunshine. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I meant sunshade. So sunshine, that's the first word given by the speaker. But he changed his mind and said, oh, no, it's not sunshine, but it's sunshade. What's our rule here? The first answer given is usually wrong. The second answer given is usually right. So remember that speakers change their minds. And it's the second detail that you have to write on your answer sheet. Okay, some answers are found in the other questions. That's why it's best that you read the questions beforehand. Because by doing this, you get to have an idea of answers to certain questions. For instance, question number one, what is the name of the first magazine in Australia? Question number two, what is the name of the magazine pattern after 717? So chances are, for number one, the name of the first magazine is 17. There are so many wonders and benefits when you read the questions ahead of time. And this is one of those. You can get correct answers by merely looking at the other questions on the test booklet. Okay. Now, this is the time I'm going to emphasize. You don't always rely on your ears because not all the words are mentioned in the same way all over the world. For instance, I'm going to deliver this sentence that you see here on your screen. And please tell me if the word is Greek or great. Here we go. In every room, there is a great painting. Class, did I just say Greek or great? Let me repeat that one. In every room, there is a great painting. Did I say Greek? or great. Okay, the others thought it's Greek, the others thought it's great. But when you see Greece, the country Greece in another item, that's your clue that the correct answer is Greek. Remember that not all words are delivered in the same way, including letters. Like, we Filipinos usually say H, but for other nationalities, they say H. Or what about the letter Z? Not everyone all over the world says this as Z, the others, Z, the others, Z. Perfect example is the number seven. We Filipinos usually say seven. However, other nationalities might say this as seven. Or in New Zealand, that is seven. Because remember, over there, E becomes I, I becomes E. So don't always rely on your ears. Get clues from the test booklet. Okay, let's take a look at the next bullet point. When there is a pause, that's how symbolic pauses are in the IELTS. It could only mean that an answer must have been given. So better move on to the next number. So if there is a short Pause. Usually, the last detail mentioned is an answer. So, move to the next question. We also emphasize on using texting spelling when you take note of details so that you can take note of more information. Remember, it's a waste of time writing because when in fact you can just write back or cause, or instead of spelling it out as until, you can just write till. Make sure that they're all spelled out when you write the answer on the answer sheet. But when taking notes, yes, you can use texting or shortcut spelling. Okay, learn how to identify the key words. Let's take a look at numbers one, two, and three. Okay, so number one, how many zines were sold? 
This is our indicator that we're looking for a number because of the question, how many? What about number two? Where is the publishing team's office located? For sure, we are looking for a place because the question is where. And then number three, what is the name of Jeans Magazine? Obviously, we are looking for a name. So keywords will tell us what kind of answer we are looking for. And then here we go. No blacks. If you are taking UPCAT UPCAT or the UP College Admission Test, you have to be careful in answering the questions because UPCAT follows right minus wrong format. Sometimes if you are not sure, it's best to leave it black. It's just that IELTS is not like that. You won't be penalized if your answer is wrong. So as you can see, it says here, guessing is the last option. But guessing is a lot better as compared to leaving it blank. You're not going to get any deductions if your answers are wrong. So just try to guess and make sure no blanks for both listening and reading. Okay. Now, I, I like this one. This is applicable, not just for IELTS, but it, uh, this is applicable for love life as well. If you have completely missed a question, leave it and towards move on. You don't want to get further behind, right? You concentrate on what you are doing and what is ahead of you, your future, not what is behind you or your past. So, whether it's IELTS or real life, towards move on. Now, what about the others? Okay, something interesting here. Zero is not always mentioned as zero all over the world. The others say, oh, the other people say no, or other speakers say this as not. What about point? In the context of a number, this usually functions as a decimal point. So say, for instance, 9.0. In this case, I need you to look at 0 0.4. Pay attention to me while looking at 0 0.4. Here we go. 0 0.4, 0 and 4, 0 point 4, 0 and 4, 0 point 4, 0 and 4. Not point four, not and four. All of those that I've mentioned, they are exactly the same, 0 0.4. Remember, what you know is not necessarily how the speakers in other countries say it. And what's more interesting in the IELTS is a combination of native and non-native speakers talking in English. So the world does not revolve around you, but instead you have to be open to what? The possibility that how you say a word is not exactly the same as how other speakers in other parts of the globe actually say it. What about fortnightly? In IELTS, there are instructions that indicate you just have to write one word for your answer. So if the speaker says once a day, three words. You don't write once a day. The instruction is do not write more than one word. So what's one word for once a day? Daily. Once a week, weekly. Once a month, monthly. Once a year, yearly or annually. But what if it's once every two weeks? One word for that is fortnightly. I've encountered this in one of the practice tests. And I'm saying this because I don't want this to be the only reason why you cannot get the perfect 40 over 40. So the next time around, once every two weeks, ah, that's fortnightly. During the reading major lecture, we focus on true, false, not given, and matching headings. But for tonight, we're going to focus on two types of questions, gap fill and multiple choice. So for gap fill, this is how the people in the UK, uh, this is the term that they use when pertaining to fill in the blanks. Well, when we were in high school and elementary, we usually call it fill in the blanks. But in IELTS, it's known as gap fill. So you're going to complete a sentence, a diagram, a table, a map, and so on. There are two types of gap fill. One, 
there's a table of options from which you can choose the answer. And this is easier because you're 100% sure the answer is just there in the table. But sometimes it's type two that comes out in the IELTS. And this is the more challenging type. No table of options. And why is this more challenging? Obviously, you have to, you have to make sure that you pay attention to the correct word because there is no table for you to choose, uh, no table of options from where you can choose your answers. In answering gap fill type two, remember the following. Number one, make sure that your answers are grammatically correct. So, take, kindly take a look at this example. And it says, one of the positive effects of ecstasy is that it can blank. Now, what if the speaker said, making people happy is one of the positive effects of taking ecstasy. So, if we get the exact words of the speaker, Making people happy. Now let's try to fill that in the blank. One of the positive effects of ecstasy is that it can making people happy. Guys, can making people happy, is that correct? Yes or no? Can making people happy, is that right or wrong? No, correct. So you don't change the word you only change the form of the word to make sure that your answers are grammatically right. So how are you supposed to write it? Make people happy. Class, grammar matters in the listening and reading subtests. Also, we have to follow the instruction regarding the number of words. Okay. So if the instruction says, write no more than three words for your answer, what does this mean? One word as an answer, correct. Two words as an answer, correct. Three words as an answer, correct. But the moment you feel that you need to write more than the required number of words, like four or five, uh-uh, you are wrong. So can we look at the two examples that we have here? A atmosphere is much more pleasant. What if those are the exact words of the speaker? But count. let's count how many words are here. Atmosphere is much more pleasant. There are five words. Now, I need you to be discerning and tell me which three words are we supposed to retain and write on the answer sheet. Kindly type your answer on the chat box. Atmosphere is much more pleasant but you're required to write only three words. Ter, said, pleasant atmosphere. What about the others? What about the others? Okay, unfortunately, you cannot write pleasant atmosphere or atmosphere is pleasant because there has to be emphasis on the atmosphere becoming more pleasant when something was introduced. That's why the correct answer is atmosphere more pleasant. It doesn't really hurt if you don't change the order of the words. So atmosphere more pleasant. Now, what about the second example? Same instruction. There are five words here. I need you to retain three words. Class, fire risk is greatly reduced. Can you tell me which three words are you supposed to write on the answer sheet? Pick three, fire, risk is greatly reduced. Okay, fire, risk, reduced is correct. Some people write fire is reduced. It's wrong if you're going to write fire is reduced because in the first place, there is no fire yet. Some people write, Fire greatly reduced. Once again, there is no fire yet, so you're not reducing fire. So what is it that you're actually reducing? The risk of having fire. So the correct answer is fire risk reduced. Now, let's move on to multiple choice. So in IELTS, the first type of multiple choice is our typical high school type of multiple choice. One question, 
four options, one correct answer. However, there are also instances when there are multiple choices and yet multiple answers, but there's just one point for that. So obviously, this is the more challenging type because you have to get two or three correct answers just to earn one point. Read the questions and the choices. And while you're doing this, kindly identify the key words. The most important tip I'd like to share with you all, you do not always expect to see in the options the exact words that are mentioned by the speakers in the recording. And for me, multiple choice is more challenging compared to gap fill. Because for gap fill, the speaker is going to say the correct word. But for multiple choice, the exact words of the speaker might not exactly be the same words you're going to find on the test booklet. That's why you usually encounter multiple choice in parts three and four in the listening subtest. Three and four are usually more challenging compared to sections one and two. What else do I have here for you? So carefully examine all choices. You identify each of them as accurate or inaccurate because if something is not accurate, then you remove it as one of the options. So that will make sure you only have few options left, only the accurate ones. Wait a minute. Okay. So in IELTS listening, there is no such thing as sounds like answers. However, synonyms or related words might be considered correct answers. Now, most importantly, you choose the accurate option. It is possible that there are two accurate options or three accurate options, but you ask yourself, which of these accurate options is actually answering the question because it's not enough that the speaker mentioned this as an option. It might be possible that uh, the speaker mentioned this option. However, that is not answering the question. So do not forget to ask yourself which of the options mentioned is actually answering the question. Now, that wraps up our discussion for the listening subjects. Now, if I... Uh, if you want me to share a material that is really challenging, okay, kindly try to look for this on the internet, okay, 404. If I'm not mistaken, the complete name is 404, 404 Essential Tests for IELTS. I'm not sure whether, uh, not Essentials, okay, that's 404 essential tests for IELTS, okay? I'm not entirely sure if it's the word essential, which is part of the title, but just type 404. It's going to appear immediately on Google, okay? Of all the listening exercises I've done in, in my last 15 years of teaching IELTS, I find 404 as the most challenging of them all. And really, this is more difficult than the actual exam. So if you're used to answering the most difficult practice tests, then the actual examination will be a breeze for you guys. Okay, 10.53 p.m. I'm done with my discussion. So it's time to ask you guys if you have questions or clarifications. Now, while you're typing your questions, a few days ago, uh, Sir Marvin, uh, Miss Gladys of IFNG, uh, and me included, we discussed the possibilities of conducting more classes in the future. So, number one, definitely we cannot do a free class next week, Wednesday, because it's the end of the month, and this is when we are busiest. So, we're going to have if given the chance, we're going to conduct another class two Wednesdays from now, looking at the calendar, July 7. So we're done reading, writing task one, writing task two, speaking. So I need you to comment. Which one would you want us to talk about two Wednesdays from now? Like, uh, I proposed to Sir Brian Martin Shawson, our lecturer who got nine overall band score, nine in listening, nine in reading, nine in writing, nine in speaking. 
um, Sir Brian, can we do grammar for males? It's a discussion, which is very important because apparently in writing and speaking, grammar matters. Or perhaps we can do a vocabulary for IELTS, but you guys are our bosses. So whatever uh, the pulse of the attendees, we're going to obey you are. We're going to grant your humble request. Okay. While waiting for a question from the reading, I'm done with reading two Wednesdays ago. All you have to do is to search for my free class on reading. Speaking, I, I'm done with that four weeks ago. Wait, where are the questions? Writing and speaking. I suggest you just uh, back read, okay? Uh, uh, I'm done with listening, read. With, with I, I'm done with all the four subtests. And in fact, if you watch the five classes, that's a total of 10 hours already, okay? Uh, there is a question. After taking the IELTS exam, how many years valid for the result? Two years, whether it's IELTS, OET, PTE, TOEFL, CELPIP, all of these English examinations, the results are valid for two years. Idioms for speaking, what for? You're not required an idiom to pass the examination. I never used idioms since I started talking or opening my mouth at 9 p.m. Don't force yourself to use something that's not required. Okay, Jazz, you're welcome. So we're thinking of grammar for IELTS or vocabulary for IELTS. If you want something for speaking, then go back five weeks ago. Still here on the Facebook page of IFNG. You want something for writing? I did two versions already, writing task one and writing task two. Just go back uh, four weeks ago and three weeks ago. If you're looking for reading, just go back two weeks ago. Okay, what about maps? What can I do? What, what can I do for you? I mean, for maps, you just have to remember that that's the north, okay? That's the south. And then what about east and west? East is to your right, and then west is to your left, okay? Hazel asked, if I write my answer in uppercase in the first question, then answer in lowercase in the next number, is it still acceptable? Well, IELTS uh, experts, I've heard when I attended their workshops, want you to be consistent, okay? Don't play safe. You want to be, you want to be correct? Uh, you, want to use in, you want to use all caps? Then stick to all caps from beginning to end. You want to use lowercase? Then make it consistent from beginning to end. Please help me with map questions. What, what, what can I do for you? Like you just have to know where is this, okay? North, south, uh, east, that's to your right, west, that's to your left. Because if you don't know your directions, then definitely you'll really get lost when you're using a map. Okay, Shell asked, how do I enroll? Well, we offer a very uh, affordable review fee only at 4,000 pesos if you enroll by yourself. However, if you're with at least three friends, so that's group of four, it's 3,500 per head. This is inclusive of IELTS, OET, and PTE already. So if you are not yet sure which English examination you're going to take or you're totally undecided regarding your destination, then three-in-one package is what we are offering. So if you choose to, if you decide to change your mind somewhere along the way, then one thing's for sure, the English examination that you are required to take is already included in the package, okay? So Raman, lecture on subject verb agreement, well, that's incorporated in grammar for IELTS. More lecture in multiple choice. If you're enrolled in the program, and this is like a, sa a sampler, okay? Well, obviously, I cannot talk uh, about everything in two hours, what we usually discuss for 14 hours a day because we have classes from 9 to 12 in the morning, 1 to 4 in the afternoon, 4 to 6 in the afternoon, 6 to 9 in the evening, and 9 to 12 midnight. With 14 hours of live and interactive classes, 365 days a year, I doubt if there is something that we cannot touch or tackle during the actual review program, okay? So tenses, yes, that's part of the grammar for IELTS discussion. 
I have taken my IELTS and got a 7 in speaking. However, kinulang ang OBS. What would you suggest? Well, it's easier to get a higher band score in listening and reading as compared to writing. So if you want to if you want to pull your overall band score to 6.5, focus on the sub, uh, the objective components of listening and reading. Okay? It's 10:59 p.m. We only have 1 minute left. So uh, if you don't have questions, allow me to take this golden opportunity to thank uh, Sir Jeff, uh, Sir Marvin, and Miss Gladys, the admins, the organizers of IFNG. I would like to thank them for this initiative to come up with free classes to help uh, aspiring IELTS passers not just to pass, but uh, ace the examination. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So... So, Irvin, there's a question on Facebook from Jaya. Yes. My program po kayo to focus ng LRW. Well, we, we just have one rate, okay? So, 4,000 is inclusive of everything. So, whether you review for just one subtest, it's 4,000. You review for all four subtests, it's 4,000. And that's uh, unlimited for one year. So, if you do the mathematics, 4,000 divided by 365 days, it's like spending 11 pesos per day. We have lectures. So, that's the group. Uh, class. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Seven days a week, 365 days in a year, 24-7. So some people are asking, can I be accommodated or what are the chances that I'll be accommodated? Well, we have a total of 60 qualified instructors and they can accommodate more than 440 people for one-on-one -on -one coaching every single day. 440 is the minimum because some of the coaches, well, they're just working from home. So some of them work for like 14 hours in a day. So uh, if I'm going to calculate that for eight hours per day, that's minimum of 440 students. So yeah, wherever you are, we even have students from Africa, from South America, from all over Europe and all over Asia. So location is not a problem and schedule is not a problem because apart from the live classes, there are also interactive versions. The only problem is your commitment. How badly do you want to pass this examination? Because this is a two-way process, okay? It is our duty to teach, but it is your duty to learn. It cannot be a one-way stream. So we're already offering you something that's cheaper than the plain rice being sold in convenience stores at 15 pesos. What we're offering is just 11 pesos per day. So budget and schedule are never concern, are, are never the biggest concerns here. Okay, for the last question, from Marielle, mm -hmm. from Marielle, but for example, for listening, tuturuan po ba kami how to answer computer-based? Well, uh, think of it this way. For paper-based IELTS, it's been there for uh, 31 years already because it was first introduced in 1989. So wherever you go, there will always be uh, mock tests for uh, paper-based IELTS. However, if you're asking for computer-delivered practice tests, this is when uh, you pay for the IELTS examination fee, and then both British Council and IDP will offer you materials for computer-delivered examination. So if you want to get practice tests for computer-delivered IELTS, I suggest that you book for your examination like two months in advance or three months in advance so that you can utilize the materials being shared by the testing centers. With this, you get to have a feel of how it's done in the actual examination. Because as, as I checked online, there are certain uh, computer-based practice tests that are not from Cambridge. And that's just not really how it works. I mean, you're taking an examination which is d uh, developed by Cambridge. So make sure that the practice tests that you're going to do before your examination must also be from Cambridge. So this is one way of studying smarter, not studying harder. You might want to answer all the computer-delivered practice tests on the internet, but if they are not from Cambridge, then that's totally useless. So remember, study smarter, not harder. All right. So by the way, Sir Irvin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Sir Jeff. Sir Jeff? Hi, Sir Jeff. Good evening. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad that I made it on time. Not on time. So yeah. So if you have um, all those questions, it's very easy to find Niners. You can Google, you can YouTube. Or even you can search them on Facebook. 
All right. So I think there's no more questions. So any final words, Sir, sir Jeff? Uh, <laughs> we're always looking forward to another meeting like what um, the members are saying. But if you want more detailed and short lecture, better to ask directly um, nine nurse. So it's going to be you, the one who will benefit. And like what Sir Irvin said, it's, and I also believe, we also believe in IFNG. It depends on the um, student. You're the one who will... Uh, work hard for this. We will just guide you. We will just one, guide you. You'll be the one sitting for the exam, not us. <laughs> okay. So, Correct. All right. So I think that's all for tonight. So thank you, Sir Irvin. We're looking forward for your next lecture as what we talked about before. And we'll, we'll announce ahead of time if it's going to be grammar for IELTS or vocab for IELTS. Jazz, you can just, just send that message to me privately. Yes. Okay. So and okay. yeah, Gads, I just want to add. Okay. Yeah, because some of the question was already discussed during previous weeks. So it's recorded um IFNG Facebook. So you can Google and um, you can search on our YouTube um list. I mean video list on our Facebook. Yeah, on our page. Okay, so thank you as always, Sir Irvin. And it's a pleasure to have you always thank you, sir. in our live lecture. It was so, an informative session again. Okay, so thank you, Sir Jeff. Thank you, Sir Irvin. Thank you, Sir Marbs. Ingat. Ingat to your thank, thank, thank you, Marvin. Thank you. God bless everyone. God bless Sir Irvin, everyone. thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.